Hello, everybody. We're going to get started. If you could take your seats and um, if you could also move in from the rows, that would be helpful as people come in late. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jessica Yeager. I'm the executive director of the NYU Furman Center, and I'm pleased to welcome you today to By the Numbers, our annual event to mark the release of our State of New York City's Housing and Neighborhoods Report. This is our 15th year producing the SOC, as we call it, and our focus chapter this year is on gentrification. We have a great research presentation and panel lined up on that topic. But first, I want to thank the organizations that sponsor this event and the report. We would not be able to produce the SOC without their generous support. Their names are listed in the program and in a few other places here today. Their support allows us to provide the report free of cost to all of you and to the many other organizations across the city that use its data and analysis. So please join us in thanking them if you see them here today. The NYU Furman Center is a joint center between the law school and the Wagner Graduate School of Public Service. Many of the maps, charts, numbers, and even the beautiful photos that you see in the book today are the work of our talented master's students from Wagner. We are very lucky to be associated with Wagner and its terrific students. And I'm very glad that Wagner Dean Sherry Gleed could join us today to say a few words. Please join me in welcoming Dean Gleed. Thank you, Jessica. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you here today. Uh, as, you hear, as you heard, the, the, the Furman Center is jointly sponsored by NYU Law School and by the Wagner School of Public Service, and we are really proud that over two decades, it has become the leading authority on affordable housing, land use, urban policy, and real estate, both here in New York City and I think around the world. It's developed a reputation for its rigorous research and policy-relevant analyses, um, and the Furman Center has uh, informed debate and helped to shape policy in all of these critical areas. Uh, it, has it has become indispensable, uh, and, and I think all of you are, it, it produces the indispensable and widely anticipated, uh, you can hear me anticipating it today, uh, annual, annual report on the state of New York City's housing and neighborhoods. Uh, the latest issue was just released. It's a vital resource that I look forward to reading and to hearing more about. I want to thank Jessica, all of the firm and staff who've worked so hard on this report, and especially our master's students, and especially my colleague, Pro Wagner Professor Ingrid Gould Ellen, who's the faculty director of the Furman Center. I don't want to keep you from the report any longer, so I'd like to introduce Ingrid. Welcome. Terrific. Thank you, Sherry. And um, welcome, everybody. Um, first of all, I hope you will all take home a copy of the beautiful blue um, State of the Cities uh, Housing and Neighborhoods 2015 report, um, the, um, and, uh, which you can get out at the, at the reception uh, uh, desk. The, um, the State of the City provides a, a mountain of data on the housing and uh, demographics, land use, and conditions in, in the city's five boroughs and its 59 community districts. Um, there's a lot of information to digest, and I know you can't wait to dive in, but um, I want to briefly um, provide um, some key findings, uh, give an overview of some of the key findings from the first chapter of, of the report, of the, our focus on, on gentrification, which I, which I hope will set the stage for what I know is going to be a really terrific panel discussion afterwards. Um, so the costs of housing have been, have been going up in, in many cities across the country, and New York is no exception. Between 2006, uh, 2005 and 2014, median rents increased by 15% in New York City, even after controlling for inflation. Um, and incomes have not kept up. Um, during the same period, uh, real incomes only went up by 2%, um, squeezing household budgets and forcing households to pay a growing share of their income on rent. Um, given, this, given this math, um, uh, a, uh, households looking for rental units are increasingly coming up short. They're, incre they're finding fewer homes affordable to them. And consider a renter earning exactly 80% of the area median income in New York City. Um, 
In 2000, this household, when looking for rental units, this household would have found that 64% of the rental units on the market were affordable to them. Uh, by, by 2014, that share had fallen to 43%. And, and let me be clear, that's despite the fact that nearly two-thirds of renters in New York in 2014 had incomes at 80% of the area median or, or lower. Um, this reduction in affordability was particularly pronounced in gentrifying neighborhoods um, and in the, in the neighborhoods that we identify in the report as gentrifying, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. For example, consider again um, a household earning exactly 80% of the, of the area median income or the, or the AMI in New York. Um, in gentrifying neighborhoods, the share of units that um, on the market that were affordable to a household earning 80% of the area median income fell by 30 percentage points um, between uh, 19, uh, between two, just 2000 and 2010-2014. Um, um, and and so so how did we um, how did we define gentrifying neighborhoods? Um, People often interpret gentrification to mean very different things. And, and we define gentrification fairly simply and straightforwardly in this report as um, basically initially low-income neighborhoods that have seen above median increases in rent. Um, and specifically, in particular, we first identified the neighborhoods in New York City that were lower income in 1990. And, and these are here, the blue neighborhoods on the on the map, these are, we defined lower income as neighborhoods that were in, in the bottom 40% of, of, um, of incomes in, uh, in, in uh, city neighborhoods in, in, uh, by income in 1990. Then within this group, we identified the neighborhoods that had experienced above median increases in rent. And we identified that um, a majority, we showed that a majority, indeed a full 15 out of the 22 of these initially low income neighborhoods experienced above median increases in rent. And these are the, the darker blue um, uh, neighborhoods on the map. Um, and, and notice that they are, um, they're, 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 they tend to be centered around, around core Manhattan. Okay, so we classify the other low-income neighborhoods, sort of the lighter blue, um, kind of teal blue there, as non-gentrifying. Um, and finally, the gray neighborhoods on the map are, the, are those that we identify as, as higher income, and those are the neighborhoods that had incomes in the top 60% of the neighborhood distribution in, in 1990. Okay, um, so how much did rents go up in gentrifying neighborhoods? Um, rents in the neighborhoods we classify as gentrifying increased by 34%. Again, this is, this is after controlling for inflation between 1990 and 2014. This is significantly more than, uh, the, than, the, than the rents in non-gentrifying neighborhoods and in higher income neighborhoods. And, and notice that most of the rent growth took place after 2000. Okay, that's where we really saw this, uh, these rent increases accelerate. And some gentrifying neighborhoods saw even larger increases in rent. Um, for example, Williamsburg Greenpoint right, saw an, an extraordinary increase of 79% of in rent um, over this, in the median rent over this time period. Um, importantly, um, I want to sort of make clear that non-gentrifying neighborhoods uh, saw increases in real rent too, and a few of them, notably, notably those in the Bronx, um, saw fairly substantial increases, just not as large as those for gentrifying neighborhoods. And finally, um, many higher income neighborhoods um, also experienced large in increases in rent, especially those in um, North Brooklyn and, and Manhattan. So when we looked more closely at the 15 neighborhoods that we identify as gentrifying in the report, um, we found that they had been undergoing more pronounced shift in housing and, uh, and uh, more pronounced shift in population than New York City as a whole. Um, historically, the neighborhoods that would later gentrify suffered uh, more dramatic population losses during the 1970s, for example. So during the 1970s, between um, New York City lost a full 10% of its population, that's 800,000 800, people. This decline was even more dramatic, though, in the 15 neighborhoods that we uh, classify as gentrifying, um, where the population fell by a full 25% over the decade. Okay. Despite recent population growth, the population is still not yet fully rebounded in these neighborhoods, and, and, um, and it was still about, by 2014, um, the population, or by 2010, I guess, 
by 2010, that the population was still 16% um, below its 1970 level. The late neighborhoods that later gentrified were also those that lost the greatest um, share of their housing stock during the 1970s, and despite considerable construction activity in recent years, they also haven't quite regained the 15% of housing units that they lost during the 1970s. Demographic shifts have also been um, more pronounced and, um, and, and uh, somewhat distinct in, in gentrifying neighborhoods. And, and uh, first, um, average household income, you notice from, from this chart, shows that average household income rose 14% in gentrifying neighborhoods between, two, between 1990 and 2014. And this, this is in sharp contrast right, to the changes in, in the other, in the non-gentrifying and in the higher income neighborhoods, which actually both saw a decline in incomes during the same period. Similarly, gentrifying neighborhoods experienced the largest gains in the share of adults with college degrees, rising a full 16 percentage points during this, since 1990. Some gentrifying neighborhoods, again, experienced, um, experienced even larger increases in, in college-educated uh, residents, um, led again by Greenpoint Williamsburg, um, which saw a gain in college-educated residents of, of 26 percentage points during this time period. It's really, again, this is only like a 12-year time period, um, so it's pretty stunning change. Um, the, um, like most changes, demographic changes in gentrifying neighborhoods, the change in college-educated residents was really, was really driven by recent movers. So um, this chart's a little bit harder to, to, um, to, to understand immediately, but it's, it says that about 42% of recent movers in gentrifying neighborhoods um, uh, between 2010 and 2014 had a college degree compared to only 19% of recent movers in non-gentrifying neighborhoods. Um, the recent movers in gentrifying neighborhoods were also more likely to be young, young adults, I should say, um, from 2010 to 2014. 61% of the um, recent movers of the adults recently settling in gentrifying neighborhoods were young adults between the ages of 20 and 34. Um, the corresponding percentages for non-gentrifying and higher income neighborhoods were 48 and 55%, respectively. Another pronounced demographic shift in gentrifying neighborhoods is that the share of households comprised of single individuals um, or unrelated adults rose much more in gentrifying neighborhoods than in other neighborhoods since 2000. Um, this share, their share increased by nine per, a full nine percentage points, okay, in gentrifying neighborhoods, three times as much as the growth in non-gentrifying neighborhoods where, um, where they grew by, that share grew by 3%. As for racial composition, gentrifying neighborhoods have become somewhat more white. You can see those bars on the right, right? The percentage of, of, of residents that are white rose by two percentage points um, since 1990, um, even as the city as a whole became less white. Gentrifying neighborhoods also saw a larger decline in black population share uh, as the city as a whole. Right, the, the share of the population that was black decreased by seven percentage points in gentrifying neighborhoods and two percentage points in the city as a whole. Okay. Um, in short, through this process, gentrifying neighborhoods have become more racially integrated, uh, at least in the short term. Right? In 2010, their racial composition was not identical to that of the city as a whole, but it looked more like the racial composition of gentrifying neighborhoods looked a lot more like the racial composition of the city as a whole um, than it did in 1990. Okay, they were still somewhat um, less white and less Asian and more black and more Hispanic, the population, but they looked more like the city as a whole. Okay. So, how, so how have residents fared as these um, neighborhoods change? I, I realize that that is the big question, um, and our, but I wanna be very clear that our chapter cannot answer that question definitively, nor does it attempt to do so. Um, but, but I think we offer some insights, which I hope are useful for policy, which we certainly hope are useful. First, um, rapidly rising rents are often accompanied by um, uh, improvements in neighborhood conditions. For example, our research found that the city's 15 gentrifying neighborhoods saw a larger reductions in violent crime than the city as a whole. Um, 
And, and notice that this is sort of the, um, the, uh, the neighborhoods that would later gentrify had significantly higher rates of violent crime in 1990, right, than, than other neighborhoods. And those differences have converged as the declines in, as violent crime has declined more rapidly and more dramatically in gentrifying neighborhoods, right? But, but as we've seen, right, households in gentrifying neighborhoods are also um, seeing, uh, have seen uh, rising housing costs. And, and perhaps surprisingly, um, despite the rent increases, we didn't see much change um, in crowding in gentrifying neighborhoods. Perhaps because um, some of the most vulnerable residents may be leaving those neighborhoods and going to non-gentrifying neighborhoods. And indeed, we see the largest increases in, in crowding, the rates of crowding are occurring in the non-gentrifying neighborhoods. Um, another surprise um, was that there um, was no noticeable increase, uh, trend or increase, in the rate of um, non-payment cases filed in housing court over this period. Um, and um, indeed, um, non-gentrifying neighborhoods actually saw consistently higher rates of, of, um, of non-payment court filings than in gentrifying neighborhoods, than gentrifying neighborhoods during this time period. That said, um, we do see a, uh, a reduction in, in the number of poor people living in gentrifying neighborhoods um, since, to, since 2000. We saw a reduction between 2000 and, and 2014. Um, despite an increase, right, an increase in the poor population citywide, we saw a decrease in, gentr in poor population in, uh, in uh, gentrifying neighborhoods. And the, and the decline in, in um, the numbers of, of poor residents in gentrifying areas suggests that poor households may be finding uh, it increasingly difficult to stay in gentrifying neighborhoods as rents rise. Um, but while the reductions in, po in poor residents raises some concern about the long-run potential for integration in these neighborhoods, I think it's important to point out, um, at least in New York City, and, and Kathy O'Regan can tell us whether this is true nationally, but um, gentrifying neighborhoods in New York City have a lot of place-based subsidized housing. Um, a full 12% of the housing units in, in these neighborhoods that we identify as gentrifying are public housing units, um, suggesting some potential for long-run economic integration in these neighborhoods. In addition, over a fourth of housing units were privately owned um, subsidized buildings. Of course, in this case, right, these units may be at risk um, of, of opting out of, that, uh, of, of losing affordability as owners opt out of affordability restrictions when subsidies expire. Um, and, and I hope the panel will discuss the uh, challenge of, of preserving the affordability of these, of these units over time. So, so in short, um, what do I think are sort of our key findings are in this? I mean, you know, very briefly, I think we're seeing that households across, across New York City are experiencing significant rent pressures and shifts in household composition. But these changes were more pronounced in gentrifying neighborhoods. Um, and while the data do not suggest large-scale displacement in terms of, um, you know, certainly the uh, housing court filings, um, and, uh, but we do see that the number of poor residents in gentrifying um, areas declined, declined since, 19, uh, since 2000. Yet, I think it is important to point out that these, the presence of subsidized housing may provide some cushion and, and offers the potential for some long-run integration in these neighborhoods. Um, and with that, um, I'm gonna sort of pass the baton to our terrific panel, who are gonna address all the hard questions that I did not. Uh, we're gonna do a little bit of a set change here. Um, and um, I am gonna introduce the panel and then we'll ask them to come up. Um, I am I'm really delighted that, um, that all of our panelists have agreed to, to part oh, very nice, to participate. Um, that was magical. Um, first, uh, Laura Cusisto, who is the um, national housing reporter at the Wall Street Journal, and we're really delighted that she has agreed to, to moderate this panel. Um, Colvin Granham, who is president and CEO of the bed Restoration Corporation, is gonna join the panel together with Brad Lander, who is a New York City Council member representing the 39th District in, in Brooklyn, 
Kathy O'Regan, who's Assistant Secretary for Policy Development and Research um, at the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, and also a faculty member on leave from the Wagner School. And, and last but not least, uh, Debbie Wright, who is a senior fellow in um, the Economic Opportunity and Markets Division at the Ford Foundation. So I'd love to invite you all to come up. I also want to say, um, well, right, clap, sorry. Yes. Um, I also want to say that just in terms of questions, um, that the last, uh, about the last 15 minutes of the panel are going to be reserved for Q&A from the audience. And there are two ways that you can submit a question for the panel. The first is via Twitter using the hashtag NYC housing, um, which I think is, yep, it's up there. Um, and secondly, for non-tweeters, um, you can also write your, um, we, we're going to um, pass around some cards, some index cards that um, we're going to uh, bring up and down the aisle, and, um, and you can write your questions on the card and, uh, and pass it to the end of the row. And we'll collect those around, um, I think, around 5.30. So, okay. Well, thank you so much, everybody, for being here today. Um, we did some prep work for this panel and had very lively uh, <laughs> discussions. Uh, so I, I think you're all in very much for a treat. Um, so in, in thinking about where to start for this panel, it was interesting to me, the report talks a lot about young childish, childless college graduates, uh, which I have some personal experience with living in <laughs> neighborhoods like Bedford, Stuyvesant, and Hamilton Heights, and, and places where I live and my friends live. And I saw a lot of myself in the data, and of course I also had some sense that my own experience is a little bit more nuanced and a little bit more colorful than just data alone can tell us. And so I thought it might be nice to start off and, and talk about a couple of neighborhoods and talk about how they've changed and talk about sort of both sides of that change. Um, so Colvin, I thought maybe if you could start and tell us a little bit about bed and how you've seen it change over the last decade and, and how residents feel about it, what the sort of mix of reactions you've got has been. The last part wasn't in the script. <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah, we're, not, we're not using the script. We're not using the script. Well, I'm gonna read. Well, I'm gonna read what I wrote. Um, so, um, well, what we're seeing is an increased number of what I'm gonna call unrelated households with multiple earners who are college-educated and otherwise skill, skilled. There's a significant um, effect on low and moderate-income households who occupied units that are not rent regulated. And I think it bears saying that in Bedford-Stuyvesant, because we have a significant stock of brownstones that are essentially one to four family homes, um, or one to four pro family properties, that, that there's no rent regulation. It's not covered by rent stabilization, it's not covered by rent control. So those who attempt to remain in their units are extremely rent burdened. Some are moving in with nearby families, such as siblings, offspring, or friends, in order to share the rent burden. And many working class and moderate income residents are leaving Bed-Stuy, headed to Brownsville, East New York, or Flatbush. Um, how, do, how do people feel about it? I, you know, there is um, an excitement, I think, about the overall improvement, some of the things that you mentioned, like lower crime. Um, but there's also a great deal of fear and vulnerability because the, my sense of it is that, is that the displacement, at least at the anecdotal level from what we can see, even though perhaps not backed up by the data, is causing an upheaval. It feels like an upheaval. And so people want to stay. I mean, you know, people um, have been living there and they've been waiting for the day where there could be um, some of the amenities that we have now. Um, but at the same time, they don't really see themselves in the future of the neighborhood and that causes a great deal of concern. Um, yes, essentially that's what I would say in response. Um, Debbie, I, th I thought I would ask you, I think one of the things that struck me about the Furman Center report was that 
a number of the neighborhoods they classified as gentrifying were the neighborhoods that were the worst hit in New York in the 70s and 80s, neighborhoods that lost the po most population, um, that, that, that were really sort of devastated, and, and neighborhoods that the city put a lot of investment in and, and tried to make better. And I'm wondering, I mean, how do you sort of feel about that? To what extent do you think those cities' investments were a catalyst for gentrification? And, and do you see that as a success story? I personally view it as a home run and from several perspectives. Um, first, the neighborhood that Colvin's talking about, my dad pastored a church in Bed-Stuy for 15 years. Um, I lived personally in Crown Heights where my family also lived for the same period of time. I owned a, a house and later on I'll tell you about the night I decided to move. It wasn't um, me. <laughs> it wasn't you. It wasn't you. We're really you. going off script here. <laughs> but, but, you know, but I think, I hope we will get to the reality of living in these neighborhoods before and after gentrification and everything in between. But um, knowing these neighborhoods as a former housing commissioner and been to every borough and every other block practically, um, I personally view it as a home run. Are there consequences? Yeah, there's consequences to everything, including no investment. There's consequences to over-investing in one particular geography. Um, but I think the reality that I feel is a totality is that it's been a home run. And I think we've got the tools to deal with some of the consequences of what's happened, but I hope we don't miss the um, um, the top line for the bottom line. So, so Brad, I wanted to ask you, um, you represent neighborhoods that the Fermi Report classifies as, as higher income areas, and yet rents in Park Slope increased by 47% between 1990 and 2014. So how would you describe how that has affected the low and moderate income households in your district? Are there benefits for those households and who have been able to stay? And, and I guess what have the consequences been for those who haven't? Uh, thank you. And yeah, thanks for this panel and, and to the Furman Center for this data. Um, and I guess I'll underline two things before I answer this uh, question. I mean, I think first, the dramatic upward rent pressure on tenants across the city, regardless of whether their neighborhoods are gentrifying or not gentrifying, is stunning, and you know those people that have read evicted already, you know, can see kind of see that not in New York City, but the, if you look at the rent burden data um, that's in here when you get your when you get your book, it's uh, it's it's stunning for low and moderate income households. Extremely low income households were already extremely rent burdened, but low and moderate income households from 2000 to 2014, the rent burden increases are extraordinary. So um, an enormous amount of the anxiety that people have is that a much higher share of their household income is going to their rents, and if they're in gentrifying neighborhoods, they see it as a consequence of gentrification. Um, I will say I think there's something promising in the idea that it appears possible as a result of public housing and subsidized housing that public policy can, in meaningful ways, enable low and moderate income people and people of color to stay in neighborhoods even as new development takes place. And we should spend a lot more time on that. Having said that, um, we didn't actually have the details uh, when we did the prep call. The Park Slope data is a disaster from 2000 <laughs> to 2014. Uh, black percentage, black population declined from 11% to 6%. Hispanic percent from 24% to 16%. And the white population grew from 56% to 67%. So we're not in the gentrifying neighborhood category because we're not one of the lower 40% of neighborhoods, but that's a dramatic displacement of households of color and low and moderate income households from a fantastic neighborhood. We have really great schools. Uh, we have really great parks. It's a lovely place. I'm proud to represent it. I was a lot happier representing it when it was a more diverse and inclusive place, our schools are less integrated. So, um, I, you know, we should work harder to make sure that <laughs> rising rents don't, don't displace people, <laughs> whether or not it's a, a specific consequence of gentrification or not. So, so Kathy, I was going to turn to you. So I, I spent the first 
four years that I was a reporter at the Journal writing just about New York and then um, started writing about the rest of the country and housing policy in the rest of the country. And I mean, the, the, the first biggest shock was that you would talk to people who'd have like $300,000 houses and they'd have like central air and four bedrooms and it would be like a total shocker. But uh, the second thing that I think was a real shock to me was how a lot of these places were starting to experience similar things to what New York had but maybe didn't have the same kind of history and, and, and legacy of tools around affordable housing. And so I thought I'd ask you if you could give us a, a feel for what the picture is around the rest of the country. In what ways is New York doing better? In what ways are we doing worse? Sure, thanks. Um, and I used to be a researcher here in New York. And you walk out with research on New York, and everybody says, well, that's just New York. <laughs> right. And then there's the rest <laughs> of the country. Um, in terms of the experience of gentrification, um, some of the work that I did before going to HUD was with Ingrid on looking in, ar across the country at gentrification patterns. And now the Furman Center has expanded on that and updated. And so the, I'm actually going to use the research from here. And uh, this is a common phenomenon that has really changed in the last decade in terms of ramping up. But low-income central city neighborhoods since the 1990s have been experiencing relatively large gains in neighborhood level income and at almost a double rate to what they experienced in the 80s. And you see that in the, 19, uh, in the 2000 to 2015 data. Um, the patterns are a little bit different, so to go back, Brad, to something that you're concerned about. In the 1990s, those increases in income at the neighborhood level were not accompanied with large increases in rent and large changes in the share of the population that were white, a little bit on college educated. But so the demographic shift in the last decade plus and the rent increases are both much larger in these gentrifying neighborhoods. And that is troubling on two of the things that we would want to focus on for getting the upside that Deborah was talking about without, uh, while minimizing the consequences. And so that's a place where New York does stand out because New York has invested in subsidized stock and protection for tenants in a way that really very, there were really no other parts of the United States. So as the pressures come back in on the neighborhood, there are at least some things already there on the ground. And so what other parts of the country are talking about is how to get them in now and how to foresee where it is that you'd want to be putting some anchors. Um, so I don't think anybody has the answers yet, but I think New York is much better positioned actually than most of the rest of the country. Well, I thought, Debbie, I'd pick up on, on a cue. You had said that uh, we should talk a little bit about what the experience was like in gentrifying neighborhoods before and after. Um, I know you spent a lot of time in central Harlem, but I don't know if you want to talk about that or, or kind of just what your experience was being involved in housing policy kind of before, before gentrification, pre-gentrification. I was thinking about it as I was racing here, um, and I was the housing commissioner at the beginning of the Giuliani term, the first two years, and... My parents lived in Crown Heights because my father was a pastor out in, in Bed-Stuy. And so I decided to buy a house near them. But of course, their church owned one of these beautiful mansions right off of Eastern Parkway, if you guys know that neighborhood. I was on the other side of Eastern Parkway, which was not that great. And I remember one night um, after a very, very long day and evening, um, talking to groups like this, coming home, and um, I don't know if they still do it, but you had a, one thing you had with those jobs, as tough as they were, you had a car and driver. And I remember it was a Friday night, and Eddie dropped me off at home. And I got inside, and I realized I was going to need cereal the next morning, so I decided to put my shoes back on and go to the corner, Nostrand Avenue, and get some milk. And when I got to the corner, if any of you guys have ever experienced this living in the inner city, so the store was closed, the door was closed, but there was this little plastic wheelie where you put your money in and you get your thing you bought. And I remember paying this guy and going back out in the street and saying, what the hell am I doing living in a neighborhood where the guy that's at the store is scared to leave the door open? And guess what? I sold my home and I moved to the village. <laughs> so I think we, you know, we get so caught up in all of these um, policy debates, and it's not that they aren't important, but I think we 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 gotta get in step in the shoes of people that are living in these neighborhoods 
And the reality is, in my view, if you don't have an integration of economic resources, you can be in an all-black community, but if you don't have the resources that you need to educate your child, get a job, not live in fear that if you go get something at 10 o'clock at night, you might not come home, that's not what we want either. So I get it, but this is not just a race issue. This is successful communities of whatever color, whatever mixture. And the reality is that that can't all be one economic strata. I wouldn't, wouldn't want to live on Park Avenue either for the same reasons. I like the diversity of the neighborhoods that I've lived in, both economically and racially. But I think we've got to get to the reality of whether the neighborhoods that we are creating and supporting are capable of educating kids in a positive way, supporting nonprofit institutions and for-profit institutions in a neighborhood. That requires, I think, a mixture of incomes. And my preference, I've always lived in diverse neighborhoods. My preference is to live in a neighborhood that represents all of the colors and the races of, of our city as well. So I hope we'll, we'll get somewhat past the numbers and talk about what a truly integrated and successful neighborhood looks like and the reality of what we have to do to get that. I want to talk about that too. Please. <laughs> so um, Debbie and I have the fireworks. Um, <laughs> but we've loved but each other a very we long do, time we do, and we we're going to love each other after this panel after too. <laughs> we will. Um, You're going to move back. <laughs> <laughs> we have the same vision for the city, which is an economically integrated city, at a minimum in economically integrated, and hopefully also racially and ethnically mm -hmm. integrated. I have two concerns currently. One has to do with the departure of the middle income group which I see happening. And they're sort of a transition group for us. I think those are the folks who, who bridge between the upper income and, and the lower income groups. And I don't know, I know in bed style, it's a real concern that there's not proactive provision for that group of people to stay in the community, especially if they're not homeowners. So as we think forward about that vision of a mixed income a city, we really have to focus on the middle income group, the moderate income group, and that's what the presentation showed. The other part of this that concerns me as to where we are now in terms of the trends is that public housing and publicly subsidized housing is the place where most low-income people find a place to stay in uh, gentrifying neighborhoods. But in some communities, that housing is disproportionately clustered together. And so the question then becomes, is that true integration, right? So I would argue that to the extent that low-income people or geographically clustered. Bedford Stuyvesant is a classic example because we are losing both middle and low income residents from the brownstone housing stock, the low density, unregulated housing stock I was talking about earlier. Earlier, low income and moderate income people are being displaced from there. A lot of the low income people are moving further, what I'm calling east and south, Brownsville, East New York, other places. Or they're moving, I believe, into the publicly subsidized housing, much of which is, uh, whether it's public housing or privately owned subsidized, which, I, which as I mentioned before, in many instances is geographically um, isolated. So the question for me is, is that integration? And how would you tell whether it's integration? So are the schools integrated? We know the answer to that, no. Um, and we would have to look at all the facilities to see what would be the points of so-called integration. I would say that given the current trends, we're not moving in that direction. And the only way we will is if we dig a little deeper 
and use public policy and resources to foster it. Can I jump in on that for a second? Yeah. Um, and I was just checking my notes because I've just started reading Mark Joseph's book on integrating the inner city. And he talks about this, and he's actually focusing on Chicago, uh, the mixed, you know, a place in which we've put a huge amount of effort into changing the income mix in the old public housing stock. And, uh, and I admit I haven't finished reading the book, but I will before I make comments on it when it launches in uh, DC. And it's, it's sobering. Uh, and he's really talking about something a little different than the way that we've, I think, thought about mixed income housing, which is getting the income mix right in the housing. That's what it's about versus how do you get meaningful integration and talking about there needs to be something else that we're doing and the mechanisms and institutions in the community to make it actually happen, even when it's as close as a mixed income development. So you've actually got people right next to each other, that it is that's not the end of the policy if we're actually going to be having meaningful integration. I'll let you know what happens at the end of the book. Yeah, I was gonna ask you, Kathy, if you could talk a little <laughs> bit. We, we've sort of touched on, um, we've touched on displacement and it's, it's interesting to me, it's like, I, I, when I was covering housing in New York, I went to an inordinate number of community board meetings and all, you have to go to one of them to know that people feel that they're being displaced and see people being displaced. But the research on it is, is muddy, and I'm wondering if you can talk about what the real, or at least what the data is showing. Yes, and I'm one of the researchers in the muddy side of it. Um, <laughs> and actually, Ingrid and I were talking about this before. I think our stance on this is we both have moved towards thinking the data, some of the muddiness is really in the data. Um, so the way that most researchers look at displacement is you, you, you have limited sources of data, so we have turnover data on a unit. Well, that tells you whether somebody left a unit. It doesn't tell you where they landed, right? And so maybe part of what's happening is that as people's, uh, when people leave a housing unit in a gentrifying neighborhood, there's no chance for them to stay in that neighborhood. And so we see a different pathway versus other neighborhoods, they could move into another unit in the neighborhood. And that's something that the, the data doesn't show. There's some recent work from somebody at the Philly Reserve showing that when low income, Households leave gentrifying neighborhoods, they go to worse neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And Ingrid kind of alluded to that when looking at the poverty rates. So the poverty rates are going up in the non gentrifying neighborhoods. So is that what we're seeing on the push out? And then I think Colvin's talked about this is we tend to think about the most vulnerable population when we're looking at those turnover rates as though displacement is only among the lowest income or only among the renters. But some of them are protected. Um, from housing policies, and the middle income, the, the moderate and middle, is really rent burdened, and so we may be missing where it is that the pressures for displacement are. So I am particularly looking at the increases in rents in this last 10 plus years on top of national trends. The, what uh, Ingrid didn't point out is that these are increases in relative rents. So over and above the affordability crisis that we're seeing in the country, those in neighborhoods that are gaining, are experiencing a greater increase, that's gotta be putting on pressure. And if you're staying in those neighborhoods, your rent burdens must be amazing. So a different cost. So, so Brad, I was gonna ask you about the, the point that's been raised about middle and, and, and moderate income families. Um, as you remember, I'm sure, better than, than I, that was a part of the mayor's housing plan and there, there was a huge outcry that we weren't helping the poorest families, that we were helping families that ha actually do have options. Um, and I'm wondering, where do you think that the city should be fo fo focusing its resource? On the middle income families that we're seeing are getting really badly squeezed by gentrification, or on these families who just really are, are facing very stark choices between paying their rent and, and buying food? So, I, you know, I tried in the debate around mandatory inclusionary to say, I actually think it's the wrong question to ask. Um, I will come back to it, but I mean, the first thing to do is to strengthen the policies that we have that protect people who are already living in a place to stay there. Um, you know, I think what you have in East New York is, is enormous displacement fear. So, and you can't possibly substitute for that with a few more of the new units being at the very low income rents affordable to the folks who live in East New York. You're talking about lottery winners. So I think, and I'm excited about the possibility that the data shows this, that if we significantly strengthen our tenant protection efforts and our tenant protection policies, that we can bring in new housing at a range of incomes. And it should be at a range of incomes. I mean, some of those units should be affordable to the lowest income households, but I think there's an opportunity to spread them across a range 
of incomes, but only if the folks who are there have some real confidence that they're not going to be displaced as a result of what's happened. And there's a lot more that we could do to make that true. You know, we have our tenant protection and rent stabilization policies that they don't have anywhere else in the country, um, and yet they are leaky. We lose a lot of units. Um, and if you've been listening to the ProPublica reports, you know we have just enormous gaps in enforcement. Uh, the cheating that takes place through preferential rents, through various forms of harassment is overwhelming. Uh, wonderful today to see somebody held accountable and in court on <laughs> criminal charges for breaking the laws. Um, and you know, I was really pleased. The thing that I pushed most was to ask the de Blasio administration to adopt a policy that a lot of folks in this room have been pushing for to require a certificate of no harassment before a landlord gets a demolition or material alteration permit for a building so that we're not creating the new units on the backs of a set of people who are harassed out. And I think if we could straight, look, if we, I mean, let's, let's talk about the public and the subsidized stock as well. We're not doing nearly as well there as we need to. Investments haven't been taking place in improving conditions in public housing in gentrifying neighborhoods yet. Uh, and I want to give some credit here. I think that uh, Shola Alataye and her team are trying after many decades of neglect to figure out how we're going to do that. But if public housing were seeing investments and improvements while being able to keep the same set of families that were there, if the subsidized units that we had were more clearly and durably affordable. Let's not forget, we're not talking about permanently affordable units. So there's a lot of anxiety about what happens at the end of the affordability period. And if our tenant protections and rent stabilization regime were what the laws say it is, and then a little stronger, uh, so that you didn't have people fearing displacement through preferential rent cheating, through a range of other things, I think there would just be a lot more room to have less anxiety about exactly what percentage of new units through inclusionary, through the market, through subsidy, were available at what incomes. Because of course the answer is, and you can see it, there's rent burdens across incomes, it would be great to be creating extremely low, very low, low, moderate uh, income units through our subsidy and our inclusionary policies. In every one of those categories, a relatively modest percent of people who apply are going to get it. It'd be a lot easier to tolerate that if you had confidence that people weren't getting pushed out at the same time. So, so Debbie, let me ask you, I, I, I thought it was interesting and I was surprised when Ingrid said that 12% of uh, units in gentrifying neighborhoods is public housing, about a quarter is some kind of other subsidized housing, and yet we're still seeing rents increase rapidly in those neighborhoods. Uh, do, you, do, do, you, um, do you think the answer is, as sort of Brad is talking about, to, to strengthen some of those protections? Is the answer that we should be doing something else? H how do you think we should approach this going forward? You know, it's a, it's, a, it's a tough town already in terms of protections. I certainly would support as much as we need to make sure that people are not illegally forced out of uh, their homes. I think that's criminal, should be, and we should draw the line at that. Um, I think public housing, though, is at the center of it. The, the reality is that it's been underfunded for many, many years. I was there for a couple of years, you know, very hard. Um, but I think the bright lights, if we could kind of get um, the, the apartments that are offline because they need to be renovated. I forget Colvin, isn't it something like 15% of the units are offline because they need major investments. Um, somebody here has that number. So there, there are apartments that are offline. There are also apartments where, um, they're underpopulated. Um, we've had a, a lot of issues over the years where a senior and a son or daughter is in a three bedroom apartment, but they won't move to a two. I mean, there's just so many issues there. And there's also a lot of land in each of these developments that could support new buildings as well. So I know it's a very complicated, um, thing to run a, a federal agency in a new in a city but I think if we could figure out a way between the unions and the public and the public debate between the federal government and the cities in which these buildings are in 
that ultimately there's a lot of expansion in units that are available there, uh, both through rearranging living arrangements today and building new developments. And, and there have been proposals around new models of public housing where this, this is more integrated economically, et cetera. So I think that's the biggest opportunity, although uh, granted it's, it's fraught with a lot of political considerations, which thankfully is not my um, <laughs> job. I mean, Colvin, what do you think? I mean, would would building on public housing land, would building more mixed income developments on public housing land, are those good solutions for bed -Stuy? Are there other ones that you would highlight as sort of a couple of specific ideas that would be the most helpful in your neighborhood? Yes, um, I, I agree with what my fellow panelists have said. Um, I, I want to say one thing in addition to that, two things. One has to do with home ownership. The other one has to do with trust, right? I, I was actually shocked by the ferocity with which the mandatory inclusionary housing proposal was met. And I'll never forget thinking that we're not gonna be able to achieve this vision of economically integrated city if low-income people have no trust whatsoever. So for example, in some communities, the argument was that essentially, it seemed to me, was that if our area median, median income is $35,000, that's what should be built. Housing that meets area median income. But what does that do for a moderate income person, right? So we want more moderate income people to go to Brownsville, let's say. When I say moderate income people, I'm talking about, let's just say people who are at $70,000 of household income. Those people were perceived to be gentrifiers. It might be two people making $35,000 a piece. They're, <laughs> in my view, they're far from gentrifiers. But if we want a moderate income city with moderate income neighborhoods, there can't be, we've gotta get past the trust thing. And I think the trust thing is justified because to date the city hasn't demonstrably committed to and I'm not talking about production, I'm talking about making sure that people get to stay some in, in their neighborhoods or do the best. Making sure they get to stay to me is a tall order, but care for people, right? A sense that the city is caring for people. So, you know, my point here is that to me it's sad when in a neighborhood people don't see a future for themselves at a higher and a higher income, right? We we would actually expect people to say, build some housing for incomes above mine because I have an opportunity one day perhaps to get there. I mean, that's what we want. Um, and it's gonna take a lot of work. The second thing is I'm concerned about home ownership in this city. I come from, I'm a first generation American, I guess that's what you would call me. Um, my parents came from Barbados. My dad, within a year of getting here, bought his first brownstone. That for him and a lot of other people who are coming from the Caribbean, coming from the South, was the vehicle for economic upward mobility. These are not, these were people who drove buses, swept floors. My mom was, uh, my mom was a office cleaner, whatever you want to call them, uh, the people who clean offices. <laughs> I don't even know what to call it anymore. She's my mom. But what I'm saying is, <laughs> What I'm saying is these were people who were just like regular people, you know, not, high, well, my dad was highly skilled, but you know, what I'm saying is they didn't make a lot of money and they were able to buy a home and they were able to move the family forward. That to me is like what New York City is about, right? It has been about. And it troubles me that we don't have a plan. And I'm not saying that any of this is easy. I tend to be aspirational, so forgive me. but. We need to have a plan for that. We had talked with some developers back in 2007. We got some, um, some lots that we wanted to designate. We had site control over the lots. We wanted to build moderate, moderate income home ownership on Fulton Street in Bed-Stuy. We were thinking for families that earn like 100% of area median income. And we felt that way because we could see the prices rising the brownstones. And we knew that people at 100% of area median income were not at one point, very soon not going to be able to afford that. 
And these are just, you know, these are solid folks, right? Well, in 2007, we couldn't get financing for that kind of product because there was no model for it, right? So financiers would say, what's the market for that? We said, we don't know. We want to make a market for it, right? They said, forget about that. So, um, so we ended up, so then everything fell apart because we had the Great Recession. And then, but we had to make a decision about how to use the land <laughs> during the Great Recession. And the only thing we could get financed, the only thing people were comfortable with was rental. And I remember thinking, this is a long-term decision we're making because we can't put together the resources to reach this vision. And then one day, this was going to be doable, and it's very doable now. And so we made the decision, over 255 units that we were trying to do as moderate income home ownership to do, to do rental. Now, it's good, pro they're good projects. They're mixed income projects. They're not, they don't have as many, they're 80-20s. Um, so they're not as mixed as I would like. But they are helping to economically integrate the community. So my point would be one of the other policy or devices that I would propose that we examine is home ownership vehicles, and they might be limited equity or they might be other things that capture some of the upside, but also allow the homeowner to grow some wealth. Can I just jump in oh, here? Because sure. it's, it's just my job to uh, argue with Colvin tonight. <laughs> Um, this may sa sound odd from a, uh, an ex-housing commissioner, but, you know, home ownership is not for everybody. It really isn't. And if you've been in a room with someone who you're getting ready to foreclose on because they can't keep up the payments, there is no worse feeling. There, well, there may be a worse feeling. But that's a hard thing. And, and I would say there, there are four of us, quote, unquote, kids. My parents were huge believers in homeowners, and they knocked that in our heads, going to college and leaving college. But in, a, in the Great Recession, two of my four siblings lost their homes. And in losing their homes, they lost everything else, trying to save the homes. And so I walked away from that chastened because I'd rather them have a strong 401k, frankly, than to keep investing in bricks and mortar that may or may not turn out to be worth more later because that's ultimately what you're, you're investing in, obviously tax benefits of, of the mortgage payments. And so I, I think, I, believe me, I've been a homeowner a long time. I've lost some money being a homeowner. And I've made some money being a homeowner, but at the end of the day, you want to get to a place where you can see yourself at 60, where you just got what you need, whether you're renting or you're owning. And there are, luckily, our tax system allows for preferred savings in several ways. And, and I hope that coming out of the recession and, and some of the evidence of what's happened, some of which is in, in this report, is that we'll get a little more realistic around the fact that it's, it's just not for everybody. Sure, Brad. Um, I guess I want to um, underline something that Colvin said in response, uh, which was his sort of sideline about the possibility of more limited equity uh, cooperative and ownership models, which when I was kind of coming up in community development, there was a lot of energy. Or obviously, you know, and look, a, you know, several generations ago in affordable housing when Penn South and Amalgamated and Co-op City got built. It was, you know, Mitchell, the Mitchell Lama Co-ops existed. It was a big piece of what we did in affordable housing and home ownership. Uh, even 20 years ago, it was a meaningful piece. And today, it's a, it's a very, very small piece. And I guess I would say, if in the city that is as expensive as this one, um, uh, we are going to, and in recognition of uh, some of the, that the way people try to enable uh, uh, moderate income people to become homeowners was fraught with fraud and uh, we will need some of those new models and not even new models we will need to bring back some models we know work um, and I think it might be you know a, an interesting time to try to look and see you know to me the folks at Penn South who every couple of years continue to vote to maintain their equity limitations are like heroes of affordable <laughs> housing in New York City um, and if it can work there it can work some other places too 
So, Kathy, I was going to ask you, um, the Obama administration has focused a lot in the last year, and I've written about this, on helping low-income people move to higher-income neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, what about on the policy front, on the federal policy front, what can be done maybe about helping low-income people stay in neighborhoods as they gentrify? Well, I was thinking about this after the phone call. Um, and one of the things that uh, you had mentioned is something called small area FMRs, mm -hmm. which for those of you who follow the voucher program, we uh, the payment standards are a, are a window around something that is set at the metro level. So fair market rents are a metro level. It means that for most voucher households, the uh, you are a uh, payment standard making it much more likely that you can get into a low rent neighborhood than a high rent. And we talked about, we haven't had an advance notice for a proposal we're making last summer, and this has all been talked about in terms of moving to better neighborhoods. But look at the rent increases we've seen in these neighborhoods over the last decade. Had you been successful with your voucher into getting into one of those neighborhoods, and then you experience this type of a steep rent increase, which is greater than the metro level, it's not going to be reflected in your FMR and payment standard. So you would also expect that it should work in the opposite direction. We've got some evidence from Dallas about it being useful for getting into higher opportunity neighborhoods, but it should mean that you, if you've got a zip code level rent and things are going up, that you have a better chance of staying in that neighborhood. Um, from the original moving to opportunity experiment and some of the ethnographic work, and John, I don't know if you'll remember this, we actually found that those households that succeeded into getting into better neighborhoods, like they got, they were there by like just the tips of their fingers, right? They just got into the housing stock. If anything happened, it derailed them and they moved back to a different neighborhood. But what if the rent payment standard for that neighborhood were higher? They weren't in the last unit that was available in that neighborhood. They were in a unit that was, was at code and wasn't at risk of just going away. And so you could expect, there's, you know, this is just theory at this point because we've got a demonstration going on, but it could protect. In the advance notice, one of the other questions we asked for the public comment on was, and should these apply to project-based vouchers? Okay, now that's a way to anchor in. So if you, are trying to get a hold on some units in a neighborhood that whose rent is going up and the project-based voucher comes with more money for that, you might be able to uh, more likely anchor there. So, uh, you know, should this policy go forward, it would, that would, it would be both on the voucher, possibly on the mobility side and the project-based vouchers. So this is being piloted in Dallas, but in theory could be. Yeah, we've got, uh, Dallas um, is based on a, set, a court settlement case, so we have five years of data, and I think Rob Collinson, who's the one who wrote the research, is in the audience with his co-author, Peter Ganog, and then we have five other PHAs as part of the demonstration, and we're earlier in that process of evaluating. So I was going to ask you, Brad, I think one tension that I encountered a lot when I was writing about economic development in New York was, if you have, let's say, a, a, an underutilized site, you know, a garage, whatever, should you take that and should you build affordable housing or should you build something to create jobs? Should you build a, a, a factory or something like that? I mean, from your perspective and what you've seen, what is a big, the biggest help to low-income residents in gentrifying neighborhoods? Um, <laughs> I mean, I think the challenge in either case is the odds of getting that unit or that job for pretty small for the folks who live in the neighborhood. Now, I mean, I'm also a big fan of preserving the spaces for jobs that we have, and I, I, it's an area where I think this administration has taken some good steps forward. You are, uh, you know, we've got the investments in the Navy Yard, we've got the investments in Sunset Park, we have a policy for those areas that got designated industrial business zones to be protected from some of the incursions from hotels and self-storage facilities. So. Um, and we've got new kinds of spaces for jobs emerging. I mean, the Gowanus in my neighborhood, I guess, let me just kind of anchor there because we've got a real place uh, that I'm very excited, if we can get it right, what we can do. You've got an area that was entirely manufacturing, a chunk of which has been designated an industrial business zone. You have opportunities to create, in some places, um, new residential development, and thanks to man, well, I'll say it this way. Five years ago, we fought hard against having that neighborhood rezoned because there was no policy to guarantee that new residential units would include permanently affordable housing. 
and there was no way to guarantee that the industrial business zone would be protected from additional incursions and might even have an opportunity for additional density and investments in some of the new kinds of businesses that are uh, emerging in and around the Gowanus uh, Canal. Um, and now we have both those policies in place. So we're gonna be able to better protect the industrial business zone. We've got some opportunities for mixed use development and we have some opportunities for genuinely mixed income uh, housing. So I think there is a real opportunity in, in our neighborhood to achieve a balance. Now, the balance is hard. I mean, I think this maybe this is one place that we, we could have started. The, the market does not want mixed income <laughs> communities and it doesn't want mixed use communities. It wants to figure out what's the highest and best use and do that over and over and over again. So it's gonna take a lot of planning to try to move forward in Gowanus in a way that could genuinely be mixed income, uh, could genuinely have some spaces for jobs and be mixed use. And then, you know, look, we'd like the schools to be integrated as well. So, um, uh, you know, and, and the consequences of taking those policy steps are significant. I just think the consequences of not taking those policy steps are a lot worse. And, and Colvin, what do you think? I mean, has gentrification in your neighborhood led to better jobs, better schools, you know, better quality of life for people who've lived there for a long time? Uh, I wrote down what it's led to is a lot more bars <laughs> and coffee shops. There's something between caffeine and alcohol that's going on. Uh, um, You know, I, I guess the way I look at this, and I'm looking at this strictly from a community developer's perspective, and one of the things that caused some fireworks in our prep call, you guys, this is, this is boring compared to the prep call. <laughs> um, maybe that's because there was nobody on the phone but us. But um, um, I, I like to think about the socioeconomic benefits that are being derived by community residents. So what is that, educational attainment, increase in wages, health, safety, those kinds of things. And housing is a big vehicle for that, right? I mean, most people, when they make a decision, most people, people who have options, when they make a decision about where they want to live, that's what they're thinking about. They're thinking partially about well, the building and what it, its aesthetic quality, but they're thinking more deeply about does this give my family an opportunity to live well and perhaps succeed. Now that's aspirational. I, I have that aspiration for New York City. And so right now, I, I don't see it for the long time residents, many of whom are living in public housing, many of whom are living in pub publicly subsidized housing. You know, the thing about Bed-Stuy is we, we long had a, a large home ownership core that was composed of people of color. And you know, I see Bed-Stuy as indistinguishable in many ways from Crown Heights. And so, um, I don't see quality local jobs being created. I don't see any improvement in the schools. I think the, the report shows that. And so, I think some of the amenities are great. But we still have huge health disparities and we have a range of other things and I'm not, criticizing the production of housing. I'm just saying that from a community developer's perspective, and this is where I think about intentionality, we gotta start measuring other things, right? Not just the production of units when we talk about developing communities. And this is, from my perspective, not strictly a real estate conversation. This is a conversation about is gentrification making some measurable impact in the quality of life? And I think it has, it has with you know, choice of restaurants, it has with choice of bars, and it has with choice of coffee shops. Um, and at this juncture, that's about as far as I can see the progress. Well, we talked about crime, there's no doubt. However, if you're living in publicly subsidized housing, crime rate is significantly higher, right? So you could cross the street and go to Central Bed-Stuy, which is mostly brownstones, and the crime rate is lower and you go you know, a half mile north in our, inst in our case and the crime, rate spikes. the crime rate spikes because of the of, of geographic concentration. So it's not a satisfying response, but I'm hopeful, but, we're, but 
but I, I agree with Brad, and I, and I think Debbie agrees with this too, I think we all do, is we're gonna require vision and planning and a real commitment if we wanna see the socioeconomic benefits flow to everybody. It's not just gonna be a real estate solution. I, I think, um, I think to follow on with Colvin, the rubber meets the road at school because at the end of the day, it's great to have a terrific house and great apartment, but if you're, if you're not comfortable sending your kid to the school that they can walk to, that really is the issue. And going back to my uh, education in, in Dallas, Texas, I remember viscerally when we moved as kids from a little town, Bennisville, South Carolina, to Dallas. And my mother was a teacher in that elementary school where we all were. And it very rapidly became from an integrated neighborhood to a black neighborhood. And then when we were in junior high school, the powers that be integrated several elementary schools into a junior high school that quickly became a black school again. And we got to high school, um, all of us knew each other at that point, so <laughs> the parents, and there, and there got to be some tensions over something, and it was a big mess. And the, finally, the parents got together and said, hey, this fighting and this uh, insecurity that our kids are under is just intolerable. We've moved three times. We're here at high school. Why can't we get ourselves together? And that began a, a real honest dialogue and, and the parents were in school weekly having the discussions at night after work and you know how, by this time of night, who wants to be having a meeting anywhere? And, um, and I wish I could say that it, 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 the tension disappeared, but it was a really difficult time fighting, people getting kicked out of school. It was just a mess for 10th grade. But at a certain point, the people who were gonna leave left the people who kept fighting got kicked out, and the sports thing ended up being the thing that rallied everybody around together after a very tense, some of us volunteered to be on the student government, I was one of them. And the good news is when we graduated our senior year, after all of that grief and hell, and it really was frightening as a young kid being in that situation, we went to state championships and it was a big thing, it's first time, and, and, and the Dallas Morning News did a story on our school about what we had gone through over this three or four year period and how did we come together to have whites and blacks in that stadium cheering for that team over this, this eight, nine month period and we lost at the state championships. But we ended up, this article was called Carter Has a Good Thing Going and it wrote about the, the difficult path of integration and that really just what it, what it was. And so I guess it's a long way of saying is we've made a, this, there's no city in the country that's made the kind of investment that we've made in housing of all stripes. But it, it, it ultimately comes down to people planning themselves down and getting engaged in government, getting engaged, engaged in, the, in the neighborhoods, going to school, holding people accountable. And that just, unfortunately, that may not happen in three years or five years or even a decade, but that's ultimately what's got to happen because we can't keep moving. <laughs> At the end of the day, we've got to put our feet down where we are and make the investment to get to know each other and invest in the institutions that are there. And Colvin's exactly right. If education doesn't work for the kids, what's the point of it? You can have the greatest house in the world if your kid can't get a great education so that they can go off to college or wherever they want to go, what difference does it make? So let me say a little uh, more about schools as well. I'm, I'm glad we've moved to this part of the conversation. I think maybe we have an opportunity, given some of the gentrification issues, mm -hmm. to try to figure out some things about school integration that we have failed woefully on in this city. Um, we are at least starting to have a conversation about it, thanks to Nicole Hannah-Jones, thanks to the um, UCLA study that you know demonstrated us in 2014 that we have amongst the most segregated schools in the country. Um, uh, you know the market largely determines where people live. Obviously, some of these issues of subsidized and public housing 
uh, uh, matter, but the market mostly determines where people live. The market doesn't determine where people go to school. The public school system determines where people go to school. So the choices we've made to have assignment and admissions policies that give us the most segregated schools in the country, th those are on us. That's not on the marketplace. And we keep choosing it. Now, we are finally taking some little baby steps. We passed in the council the School Diversity Accountability Act. The chancellor identified seven schools that can have this diversity admissions pilot. And they're, uh, they're sort of in gentrification round one neighborhoods like mine. Um, they're not yet in gentrification round two neighborhoods like bed and Crown Heights. Um, we could uh, get out in front and at the elementary school level, at the middle school level, at the high school level, do a lot more. We, we, look, the, the school system is mostly kids of color right now. So we, we're not going to have, a, you know, um, uh, uh, and, and we've got a very segregated city. But, you know, it would be entirely realistic for us to set a goal of doubling the number of kids in integrated schools over the next decade. Um, and then... Uh, testing, you know, like figuring out, watch, I don't mean t high stakes testing. Uh, uh, we research only testing. Re good research to yes. figure out what difference it makes. Um, so that would be, that should, that, that should be one thing we resolve to do out of this conversation is if we are going to try to figure out how to make sure that gentrification, the benefits of it are shared broadly um, and that it creates opportunity you know, across lines of race and income. Uh, then we should be intentional about making sure that it means more integrated. We all know that even more integrated neighborhoods doesn't necessarily mean more integrated schools. Um, but we need more research on it. We need some, uh, some serious pilot efforts to see what can work there. Um, I think that was not some, the housing work was something the de Blasio administration came in intending to do. Uh, school integration work is politically scary stuff, and it was not something that the uh, administration came in intending to do. Thanks to the work to some people in this room, like David Tipson's here from Appleseed and organizers in districts one and three and 13, um, we have a chance, and I think there has been some openness, um, and we ought to push forward and see what we can make of it. I'm gonna make a, a quick PSA. Uh, so uh, we're probably now about eight minutes until the question and answer uh, period begins. So uh, submit your questions now, uh, and you'll get a chance to, to sort of weigh in and ask some questions. And um, so I thought I'd ask uh, Kathy if you wanted to talk about uh, school integration. Strikes me as a, as a very tough issue. Um, yeah. And uh, maybe are there lessons federally? Have other cities done, done uh, tried things successfully? Uh, so I'm not an education expert uh, <laughs> at all, uh, but I, I was just struck by this on how intentional, and the idea that it would go from talking about uh, affordable housing to something more charged, integrating schools <laughs> is an interesting direction to go. Um, for intentionality, but I was, uh, I, had, I was out in Berkeley talking about uh, racial segregation, residential segregation, and doing some mapping, and talking about affirmatively furthering fair housing, which is, uh, some of you will know, HUD issued its final rule on AFFH uh, last summer, and this is an obligation that all federal agencies that work on housing and community development have for the spending of our resources, so it applies to those that we, who we fund. Um, and as part of the mapping, uh, we're looking at racial segregation and ethnic se segregation and schools and what this means for access to quality schools and transportation. So the maps can be quite stunning. So we're looking at Oakland and Berkeley. And there are these tables that show the, basically the exposure. The average African-American kid goes to a school of a certain ranking on the state scores versus white and Hispanic. And you look at Oakland, you see the classic racial gaps. You look at Berkeley, there's essentially none. The average African-American kid goes to an elementary school ever slightly better than the average white kid. So I got to go to dinner with some people who had worked on that policy. And Berkeley was very, very intentional. They have racially segregated neighborhoods. This is not integrated neighborhoods driving integrated schools. They have segregated neighborhoods this way. They did swaths of, it, of zones this way so that all of the zones for the schools go across the segregation lines. Mm -hmm. And so they've really managed to do this. Now, what, I, I don't know how it's playing out on test scores. I don't have that amount. But the, 
the difference, I, I've just never seen that in looking at the quality of schools nearby uh, based on race and ethnicity. Um, you know, it's Berkeley, but this is New York. Okay. Right. And, and there are right. a lot of other examples around the country using different models of school assignment, balanced choice. Um, yeah. Most look, most forced on them by court order. Exactly. So yes. instead, this was, they were chosen by elected court officials ordered integration seeking in to get schools. thrown out of office. But, by any uh, means yeah. necessary. Well, and I think it's interesting to, to bring it back to, to housing, just to totally anecdotally. It was really interesting to me. I, I lived in, in, in Dumbo for about a year, which is a, obviously a sort of very wealthy neighborhood next to uh, one of the more tougher NYCHA developments. And there was a huge controversy when I was living there about integrating the, the schools there. And it was really interesting to me just living there, how the sort of housing, I think, was sort of driving some of that controversy because the NYCHA projects were so isolated, both physically and economically, from the rest of the housing, that the only time I ever saw people who lived there was on the subway platform. And it really struck me that I think maybe if there had been more, better housing integration, the school question might have been an, sort of an easier discussion to, to have had. Well, I am hoping that under the planning process, as we're in the implementation of AVFH, communities are gonna need to be looking at this. There's actually a requirement. They will be looking at more than just housing. Um, the hope, and it also is an arena in which communities can engage. There's a public engagement process that's required in doing this. So it's not just housers sitting in a room, it's <coughs> any and all, including education. I mean, the, uh, the hope would be that five years later you look at the maps and things look different. I'd be good if there was affirmatively furthering integrated schools, though, as well. Uh, well, you know, well, the, exactly. Housing. We are a housing agency, so, but we... <laughs> I'm not saying that's be HUD. So, uh, so we are King giving you the data on and, schools. And, and, and uh, you know, honestly, Department of Ed, right now, right currently, we have leadership at Ed that thinks integration of schools is the highest priority. So I, it's, it's a, a moment in time. I don't know how long it'll last, but... So I thought I'd go uh, to a... a question because I, I think this is a fair point. I think there are at least three of us here who live or work in Brooklyn and someone asks, how did the lessons of this very Brooklyn-centered conversation <laughs> apply to the South Bronx, Eastern Queens, et cetera, where dynamics are very different? Uh, so I think that's a fair question. Uh, so I'll, I'll maybe open it up. I don't know if anyone wants to touch on how this might, this might apply to, 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 somewhere, to somewhere else. I don't know how different they are. Um, what I would say is that some of this, in my view, say I grew up in I grew up in Brooklyn during the '50s and the '60s, and one of the things that's interesting about this study, no criticism intended, is that if you start the study in 1990, as it was as was done, as opposed to say 1970 you get a dramatically different picture in my view because there were a significant number of low income and, and African American and Hispanics living in places like Park Slope and Borham Hill and, and you know in places which are now not you know were sort of outside they considered higher income so there's a dramatic there's a dramatic shift over the last 40 years um, or longer but what I would say is nobody thought this would happen in Bed-Stuy, not to the way it's happened. And so I, I would say examine these trends because we've got a lot of data now as to, to determine the predictability. And we need to get out ahead. The problem we're having now is that we're behind. Public policy is behind the marketplace. And, and, and we've got to get ahead of it somewhere. And there's still places, if there's still places that look different and feel different, they really may not be that different. And we really probably need to look at the lessons learned from places like Fort Greene and, and, and Dumbo and other places where when I was growing up that were you know predominantly low and moderate income and substantial and mostly people of color. Um, so if there's an opportunity to get control of the land at a relatively affordable cost, if there's an opportunity to build mixed income communities, even though there may be no template for it, I think we need to explore those things. I mean, Brad, do you want to talk a little bit about maybe the, the city's focus and, 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 and what types of neighborhoods the city's looking at? 
Uh, sure. I mean, you know, first I'll say that I, you know, I'm pleased to do a lot of my housing work these days with Richie Torres, who's my colleague in the Bronx. We teamed up together to, and with some folks in the room from Community Service Society and National Income Housing Coalition to get both Hillary Clinton, Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders into public housing during the New York primary, uh, something that I don't know the last time a presidential candidate had done. Uh, because while I agree that we need to take some local steps, obviously we need federal support for, uh, for public housing or we're not going to be able to uh, make the investments that we, that we need to. Um, I think it's important to take one step back if you want to answer this question from both gentrification and mandatory inclusionary housing. Another fascinating thing that happened in the debate that Colvin mentioned, just it became as though that was the entire de Blasio administration housing plan. I mean, it's worth remembering that most of the housing in this administration's housing plan, like the ones before it, are because we've made a decision as a city to put significant subsidies into preserving, uh, rehabilitating, and creating affordable housing. And off, you know, most of that has been in low-income neighborhoods. On the one hand, that raises fair housing questions. On the other hand, it's a big piece of what revitalized neighborhoods and, uh, and, and brought them back. And, and maybe, I guess, the lesson is it is strengthening and preserving those investments. It's making sure that public housing uh, gets the investments it needs to be the, the place to live. It is preserving those subsidized units and doing everything we can to figure out how their expiring use doesn't become their loss as subsidized units. And maybe if we can strengthen our ability to do that, then when gentrification comes, I mean, you know, we'll see. Obviously, the macroeconomic shifts have a lot more to do with whether people continue to move to New York City, whether there's investment in New York City, whether immigration continues to drive population in New York City. If those things change, something different will happen. If those things continue, then the Bronx will gentrify. Uh, and it, maybe what we've got is some object lessons about what we could do to get a little more out in front uh, to have the benefits better shared and people protected when it does. And Debbie, what do you think? I mean, the city invested a lot in the South Bronx during the, the period that we're ta we talked about earlier when, when we were trying to revitalize neighborhoods. Do you think that has been successful? Do you think that there's more we need to do in areas of the, of, of the Bronx um, to, to sort of see this kind of, same kind of revitalization? Well, anybody who saw it uh, back then knows that um, it was a miraculous uh, transformation. And maybe it's not what we all want it to be yet. Uh, all of us are kind of works in progress. Um, but I can tell you as a, a kid from Dallas, Texas, the first time I went up there, actually in Kathy Wiles' uh, beat up Honda, I was checking to make sure the doors were <laughs> locked, frankly, because I just never seen that level of devastation before. So relative, looking backward, it's, a tr it, it's hard to, um, it's hard to see anything but an incredible success. I think that the thing that comes next is what we've all been talking about, which is how do you integrate all of these investments? You know, a house is not a home, as they say. And people need to work. They need to be inspired. Not just, you know, go to school because you have to, but you go because you're in love with learning because there's somebody there that's invested in that happening, both at school and at home. And so I think that's, that's what we're really talking about, which is successful neighborhoods and communities really is the, the end game and um, that requires investments in the parents and in the institutions that are passionate about the communities and making sure that there's that, that soft money that exists or used to exist in the city council and other places to make sure that the institutions that are on the ground know what else is required other than brick and mortar. And so I don't know, Brad, in terms of, and Colvin, you run one of these institutions um, what else we need to do to support those institutions that are on the ground who can, can put their finger on what else needs to, to happen to have the connective tissue between the brick and mortar and the people 
that are in them to make sure that we're talking about successful communities as opposed to just successful individuals that ultimately leave because they don't have all that they, they feel they need in a, in a given geography. So one thing that I thought was interesting in the NYU report was that they found that a third of new units between 2000 and 2010 had been built in these gentrifying neighborhoods. And there's no question that at least that shows that this is not a panacea because rents still increased tremendously in a lot of those neighborhoods. We, we saw Williamsburg and, and, and Greenpoint increasing something like 80%. A couple of people have asked questions sort of along the lines of, to what extent would upzoning neighborhoods for greater supply be more effective at slowing rent growth than price controls, than rent regulation? So I wanna ask that panel that question. How do we balance trying to put these protections in place for tenants with saying that the answer might be just to build a lot more units? We need to build a lot more units. I'm gonna <laughs> say it whether it's popular or not. Um, one, I, th I suspect that one of the reasons that the neighborhood change we've seen in the last decade plus is coming with such high rent increases is it's on top of a broad affordability crisis with constrained supply generally. And we, I've been going around the country uh, talking to places that are interested in regional affordable housing and you go to neighborhoods, and, and I'm gonna use the term that, that Colvin was, which is I can't see myself in the future. So I can't see myself in this place if it looks different than this place. So we need to not build in my place, is what neighborhood after neighborhood is saying. At a time that the macro economy is people wanna move back into cities, all this is doing is increasing rents dramatically. You're not gonna save your, your neighborhood with no growth. And since so many neighborhoods wanna do this at a time when so many people wanna move in, this is just gonna fuel it, things will have to change, but I think I, we, I'm, my mantra is now we just we need to make it easier to build. We need to be responsible about it, but we have to address the overall affordability crisis, which is affecting neighborhoods beyond those that are gentrifying. So I'm going to I'm going to start and put the build more. We need to do other things, but we need to build more. And so, Brad, I was going to ask you, you've been on the policy side, but you've also been on the side of having people yell at you. What do you, what are do those you think the answer is? <laughs> I, you know, I really genuinely believe that the answer is both. We both have to build a lot more units and we have to strengthen protections for existing tenants. And even if that sounds like they're contradictory, I actually think the answer is the opposite. That is, I don't think the trust that enables you to build on vacant land in NYCHA. I don't think the trust that enables you to rezone a neighborhood to allow more density is available to you if people are afraid they're gonna be displaced from their home. So does that come with some cost because some lower density housing is harder to replace with higher density housing? Absolutely, it comes with that cost. Uh, but, I mean, it's obvious to me that we have to do both. There is no way that the production of new supply will protect one tenant from displacement in the next decade. Like, let's be honest about it. We could produce significant amounts of new units, um, either mixed income or all market rate, and just let the market go. But the time it would take to bring that new supply online and ease rent burdens on low and moderate income tenants, it might happen. I mean, I'll stipulate that you could balance supply and demand and change, you know, obviously if you brought a million new units online in New York City, you would change the supply and demand uh, equation. But the time it would take is years in real people's lives. And yes, we're, our job as elected officials is to represent the people that live in our neighborhoods today um, and fear what that means for them. So now part of our responsibility is, I think, to confront those fears. It's why 40 members of the city council voted for MIH, despite the fact that most of the community boards voted against it. I think people were willing to say, some of this is change anxiety, and we have to be willing to find new ways to build and be open to density, even though it's a scary concept. Um, but I also think if we can't do that with better protections in place, and I'll, uh, today we're talking mostly about um, uh, tenant protections and displacement, but obviously you also have to talk about school adequacy and infrastructure adequacy and creating neighborhoods that people love and want to live in. I believe we can do that while we increase density. 
Um, and if you want to see, you know, like go to, you know, look at the work we're doing around the Gowanus Canal, we're taking it head on. I guess it would be smarter politically to say, let's just say no and then wait until it comes and negotiate till the last minute and cut the best deal we can. That's not the approach we've taken. We've taken an approach which is we can build a coalition for smart, integrated, inclusive density if we get started up front and set the bar pretty high. And I can see the argument that that makes it too hard to build. Um, but I guess I think if we're living in the real world, the only way we are going to create additional density and thoughtful ways is if we have that kind of balance. And Colvin, what do you think? There's, there's been a lot of discussion in, in bed around landmarking. I, I talk to people in the community who feel like keeping the neighborhood, that brownstone neighborhood, is also about kind of protecting the middle class. Do you think that restricting development does help keep people in, in, the, in the neighborhood? No. I don't, and um, you know I'm I'm a proponent of density, and I think Brad makes good points about the timeline. Yeah, there's there's difficulty there, but I'm not a proponent of landmarking either. Um, see, my, my view is that housing is to serve people, and the aesthetics have to give way if the housing is not serving, right? We have these debates at the dinner table at Thanksgiving in my house. <laughs> <laughs> so my, 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 my brother and his wife, they live in Prospect Leffitt's Gardens, and they feel that we should not be able to see any apartment buildings from Prospect Park because that's the way it was planned how many hundreds of years ago? I don't know, was it 150 years ago? I don't know. But we can't hew to a vision of the city that's 100 years old. It's a com we have to reimagine the city. I also know that landmarking, and this is from personal experience, raises the cost of maintenance. And for moderate income homeowners, I don't know that they know what's in store for them. A stoop that they might have been able to replace for 45000 prior to landmarking costs 100000 um, following landmarking. And um, I think there's also a chance that you're going to get a lot of deferred maintenance because people can't afford to do it the right way, so they don't do it at all. And the cost of deferred maintenance has a cost, is a cost in the community, but it also might jeopardize their ownership. People do it the wrong way, and they get hit with $2,000 fines. So there's some risk there. Now, people, they want it. They want low-density, landmark communities. And these are people who are in favor of affordability. But there's a disconnect there. And we need to help folks get educated about nostalgia and the limits of it and what progress means in cities that are dynamic. The problem I'm going to go back to is trust. You know, people just don't. Well, we know people don't trust the system, right? Uh, that's evident. But we got, we've, got to, we've got to break through that conversation in a, very, in a very tangible way. So I'm not in favor of low density. Any, I mean, listen, there are communities that we've got to find a way to preserve, but we've got to find a way also to add density in trying to be respectful to some extent of the architectural significance of the community. But I'm saying if I had to make a decision <laughs> between that in accommodating folks, making sure that we have healthy neighborhoods that, that serve people, the aesthetics would give way. Well, we got asked a lot of great questions, but I think we are basically out of time. So um, feel free, I'm sure anyone here uh, would be happy to, to talk about this more if you wanted to come up and, and chat, but um, I think uh, we'll leave it here, and thanks so much to all of you for coming. So thank you to Laura, and um, thank you again to the panelists for this terrific, thoughtful discussion. Um, I just want to um, let you know we have a reception across the hall, so I know we do have a stack of really good questions and comments. We are reading them all, and you can go across the hall and, and we'll talk about them over drinks. So thank you. <laughs>